Well, I think you had a blog the other day, which was mm -hmm. on up up front your site, where where uh, our esteemed attorney general, mm -hmm. who is a lawyer, you'd think he knows knew the law, but he made a statement to Congress that because well. Relate that. I mean, uh, his, his statement was essentially that the Constitution doesn't guarantee citizens a right to habeas corpus. Rather, it says that that right shall not be infringed. And when uh, the Attorney General says this, his point is that he doesn't need to abide by the Constitution's guarantee of habeas corpus with regards to each individual citizen, uh, which is... I mean, it's just a jaw-dropping interpretation mm. of, of constitutional law. I mean, this is something everybody knows is wrong. Right. And uh, when, when the Attorney General stands up and says this in front of the Congress, no less, uh, and the people via C-SPAN, I mean, he's really making himself an enemy of the Constitution. Right. And he's really insulting everyone. Hold that thought, Scott. This requires a little more elaboration. I'd like to play back the testimony Scott is referring to. Before we do, let's review what habeas corpus is and its context in the Constitution. The term Habeas corpus refers to the legal principle that authorities must have some stated reason, some evidence that a crime has been committed to hold an individual in detention. The Constitution in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2 states that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. I should point out that this power is listed in Article 1, which lists the powers of Congress not Article II, which lists the delegated powers of the President. This is a power which Congress, in time of invasion or rebellion, can suspend, not the executive. So let's listen to Senator Arlen Specter and our esteemed Attorney General. Where, uh, where you have the Constitution having an explicit provision that the writ of habeas corpus cannot be suspended except rebellion or invasion. And you have the Supreme Court saying that habeas corpus rights apply to Guantanamo detainees, aliens in Guantanamo, after an elaborate discussion as to why. How can it be a statutory taking of habeas corpus when there's an express constitutional provision that it can't be suspended and an explicit Supreme Court holding that it applies to Guantanamo alien detainees. Um, a, a couple of things, Senator. I, I, I believe that the Supreme Court case you're referring to dealt only with the statutory right to habeas, not the constitutional right to habeas. Well, you're not right about that. It's, it's plain on its face. They're talking about the constitutional right to habeas corpus. They talk about habeas corpus uh, being guaranteed by the Constitution, except in cases of invasion and rebellion. And, and they and talk the, about John at Runnymede and the Magna Carta and the doctrine being embedded in the Constitution. Well, uh, sir, the fact that they may have talked about the constitutional right to habeas doesn't mean that the decision dealt with the constitutional right to habeas. When did you last read the case? <laughs> it has been a while, but I... But I'd be happy to go back. I will go back and look at it. Yesterday and this morning again. I will go back and look at it. Uh, the fact that the Constitution, again, there's no express grant of habeas in the Constitution. There's a prohibition against taking it away. But uh, there's, it's never been the case. I'm not aware of a Supreme Court. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Constitution says you can't take it away except in case of rebellion or invasion. Doesn't that mean you have the right of habeas I'm made by, unless I'm, there's an invasion or rebellion? I meant by that comment the Constitution doesn't say every individual in the United States or every citizen is hereby granted or assured or the, the right to habeas. It doesn't say that. It simply says the right to habeas corpus shall not, shall not be suspended except my... You may be treading on your interdiction and violating common sense, Mr. Attorney. <laughs> um, the Attorney General starts out debating what the Supreme Court ruled in the case which recognized the habeas corpus rights of Guantanamo alien detainees. Mr. Gonzalez just volunteers the statement that the Constitution doesn't give anyone the right to habeas corpus. Now he knows, as should any citizen, that the Constitution doesn't give any of us any rights at all. It simply lays out the authorities delegated to the government and specifies numerous restrictions 
on that government. The words no and not employed in restraint of government power occurring 24 times in the first seven articles of the Constitution and 22 more times in the Bill of Rights. I have no doubt that the Attorney General is well aware of these restrictions on government power, but his argument is carefully crafted to imply otherwise, at least here in the case of habeas corpus rights. Now, if people learn, learn it in the law, say these sort of things often enough, the citizenry may eventually come to believe that they do not have these and other rights unless government gives them to, the, to us. That is why it is so important to know and to understand your rights and assert these rights at every opportunity. Let's return back to Scott's analysis. So th throughout the Constitution, it, it refers repeatedly to, you know, such and such a right shall not be infringed. You know, for example, in the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, papers, houses, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be infringed. Um, so they're saying that we have that right already. They're not creating it for us. They're saying we're going to keep protecting it. Right. And so it's essentially not. It's essentially just restricting government in some way. It has nothing. Exactly. To, it really has nothing exactly. to do with us, the people. Well, the, the the you know the express purpose of of the Constitution and of you know all of our Bill of Rights protections and habeas corpus and so forth is to say, the Attorney General will never come along and try to take this right away from anybody. Right. And uh, and when he does that, he becomes an enemy of the Constitution. And when he does it on stage, in front of everyone and it causes anything less than a widespread public outcry, then you can start to see why it's important for people to really start talking about these issues in a big way. And so we hope to be one part of that discussion. Yeah. Right. It's a very instructive moment when you hear things like that. You know, when you can see and hear, you say, that's, that's how rule of law gets evaporated. Like Those are the th sorts of things that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, folks who would, you know, uh, have a tyrannical mindset. Those are the things that they would say to say, you know, this actually doesn't apply. Um, and it's it's clever to say the least, but it's it's tremendously disturbing uh, to us. So, yeah, when citizens don't know their rights, it opens up the door wide for government to step in and mm -hmm. ab abuse that. W one of the things I I think this was again a, a, a blog on the website. Uh, to review the, the recent Gonzales decision, uh, I always love these cases, the United States versus a mm. car versus mm. a certain amount of money, right. whatever, um, and the non-forfeiture issue, because that's sure. kind of wrapped up with, I mean, I remember 60 Minutes, God, about 10 years ago, did a, a, a case of a guy traveling through Tulsa. He was a, a landscaper, and he had $5,000 in cash on him. He was black, so he fit the profile, and um, the police just... You know, they approached him, they saw he had money on him, they assumed he was a drug dealer, they took the money, mm -hmm. he was never prosecuted, and it was like, at this point, years later, he was still trying to fight to get the money. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. I mean, that's been going on for decades. Oh, uh, sure. But, talk a little um, bit about the Gonzalez well, sure. decision. Um, yeah, this is, of course, a, a different Gonzalez we're talking about now. Right, not Alberto. Uh, yeah. Emiliano Gonzalez, <laughs> a, an immigrant who, uh, along with a, a group of colleagues, wanted to start a produce business. And they put together uh, all of their money, which totaled to $124,700 in U.S. currency, as the case became titled. Uh, he was pulled over in Nebraska and uh, consented to a search. And police found this money. Um, and a drug dog sniffed the money and, and alerted on it. And so that provides, under our current policy, that is sufficient evidence that this money was involved in some sort of drug activity, that they were able to confiscate the money from him under forfeiture laws. And the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld that seizure. Our, our current policy on forfeiture is that a preponderance of the evidence is necessary in order to confiscate the property as proceeds from drug activity, which means that the court needs to be 51% sure that you're a drug dealer in order to confiscate property from you for that offense. It's almost like Though, a, a civil uh, well, level a, standard as is. opposed to... And, uh, and you absolutely need not be charged or convicted or accused even of, of any crime in order for them to be able to do this. And uh, Emiliano Gonzalez, though he had his life savings and all of his hope for the future taken from him that day, uh, was never charged of a crime. 
and um, you know the details are, are too numerous to relay here. But I think that anybody who who read through uh, the decision in the case and the amount of, of evidence that that, uh, that Gonzalez did provide of witnesses and corroborating details and so forth, I, I think it's unlikely that anybody would conclude that this guy was guilty of of any criminal activity or that this money was intended for any purpose other than that which he explained so carefully and thoroughly to the court. Right. And so, you know, ultimately we have, you know, sort of two things here. It's an example of of a criminal law, essentially, uh, civil law, I suppose, uh, it's more accurate, uh, that really, really tips the scales of justice ag against the innocent and makes uh, an unjust outcome very, very likely to occur uh, frequently. And uh, as you know, simultaneously we have a citizen who doesn't understand his rights and wasn't able to assert his Fourth Amendment rights during that police encounter, mm -hmm. and uh, so the combination of the two uh, resulted in a, in a terrible injustice here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't expect to be able to, to change these forfeiture laws overnight, but one thing that we can do is we can teach people like Emiliano Gonzalez about their rights during police encounters and hope to make them slightly less vulnerable to a policy like this as others work to hopefully change that policy entirely. Right, and that's exactly what we, you know, that's you know, that's what I always see. I always try to focus on when we, whenever we, uh, you know, talk about, you know, interesting constitutional issues that we care very deeply about. Um, but, you know, I'm always concerned about our audience, which is actually, it's interesting because our audience consists of the people we most want to uh, focus on, we, we most want to bring our information to, are people that know nothing mm -hmm. about the constitutional rights during police encounters, know absolutely nothing. In fact, folks that are often prone to believe all sorts of uh, pernicious myths that actually are very counterproductive, and we can, we'll cover those. Um, but also folks who are uh, you know, we, we always have to keep on top of stuff to make sure that we're able to speak uh, to the mavens, you know, of constitutional rights who really do know the stuff. And they're not the people that I'm the most, you know, focused on because mm -hmm. they already know their rights, right. you know, pretty well. So these are the folks who are going to be helping make, you know, uh, flex your rights materials available uh, to the rest of the folks, uh, the 95% of the folks who know, you know, very little about their rights during police encounters. The 95% of folks who, uh, according to a University of North Texas um, survey uh, of, of police stops, um, consent to police search requests. So, you know, this is, these are the folks who we are, uh, who I, you know, I'm particularly most concerned about getting the most basic information to. So, you know, I, that's what I was just trying to, like, essentially we try to dumb it down for for lack of a better term you know what is the best way to get this the boiled down information to the most people uh, the most efficiently and, I, and of course the video is by far has been the most effective way of doing that right. um, well I guess that goes to um, well I was thinking there was a comment by somebody and it came down who was criticizing um, the your approach because in, in the video, um, in at least two cases, the people in reality um, had uh, drugs that are at least illegal under the current regime, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, see, because my point of view is they're not committing a crime. Just because it's against the law doesn't make it a crime, uh, but mm -hmm. that's another issue. <laughs> um, but this individual was saying, well, you're trying to teach people who have an intention of breaking the law uh, how to, quote, get out of it. And, uh, but the Gonzalez case is a perfect example of somebody who, because they didn't know their rights, an innocent person at least suffered a penalty, not a criminal penalty, mm -hmm. but maybe even worse than a criminal penalty in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, talk about some of the uh, I think those there are kind of reasons and issues. There are, there are two ways I would approach that. I think first off, uh, and both these are as you know, they're axiomatic. Um, first is that there are so many criminal laws out there. I mean, there's more criminal laws out there that than there have ever been, uh, and so. There are so many ridiculous, um, non-you know—violent, consensual activities that can actually land you in prison. 
so it's essential for you know these folks, you know, are obviously are, are very keen on understanding our information. You know, we don't we don't really have to sell that to them. Um, you know, Scott and I, you know, are definitely pretty open about the fact that, for example, we don't believe it's in the best interest of society or an individual, a young person, to get arrested for marijuana smoking. You know, we would argue that they would be better off if they essentially get away with this in their youth, so that when they grow up, they could one day. Be president, you know, for example, like I mean, Bill Clinton, or, exactly. or even be the, <laughs> like uh, been George Bush's daughters, or whatever. I mean, it's such a snarky way of putting it, but it's just so present there that you know that I really, you know, I believe that. So I think those folks, you know, definitely, I, I'm glad that they they are able uh, have access to the, this information. On the other side, are folks who uh, who need to know this are, are folks who. I've never done anything illegal. In fact, you know, they, they take pride in the fact that they don't do anything illegal and they respect the rule of law. These are the folks who also particularly need to understand their constitutional rights during police encounters. I mean, I speak with, you know, people that email me and, or speak with me and they say, you know, if a police officer pulls me over, you know, I'm going to let him take a look. You know, like, what's the big deal? Well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on 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 a, on a small level, there is a there's a huge waste of time going on there. If you know that you do not have anything illegal in your car, why would you waste a police officer's time mm -hmm. searching your car when he you might be undermining his ability, his or her ability to respond to an emergency? If they're digging through your belongings, it's going to take a little bit longer for them to get back in that squad car. Why would you waste? that time while waiving your Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizures. So on so many levels, uh, it makes sense for people who are not involved in anything illegal uh, to refuse searches, not to mention the many cases that I've heard anecdotally from folks who, believing that they had nothing to hide, consented to a search and it turned up something that, A, they forgot was there, but also just as frequently, something that a friend of theirs or a family member left in there, in their ashtray. So there are multiple reasons why uh, you should never consent to a search, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, I would add, you know, something there as well that, you know, I think one, one of the reasons that, you know, Fourth Amendment rights and other Bill of Rights protections are, are often viewed by, by law and order types as, you know, sort of a tool of the guilty to, to evade capture and prosecution, et cetera. You know, one of, the, one of the reasons that that happens is because so often, you know, Supreme Court cases and, and other high-level court cases that deal with these issues tend to center around severe criminal conduct. And that's because only... Uh, you know, defendants charged with severe crimes have standing or an incentive to to make these Fourth Amendment challenges. And so, you know, you deal with a case like Cabalas versus Illinois last year, uh, dealing with drug dogs, where the the defendant uh, did have a substantial amount of marijuana in the trunk of his car, but the the court ruling that resulted. Uh, said that you know anybody during the permissible scope of a traffic stop can be subjected to a drug dog search so the impact of that is you know yes this one guilty defendant will go to jail as a result of that decision but uh, an untold number of completely innocent people will be confronted with snarling drug dogs uh, as a result of that decision as well and so you know in every case it, it is typically the quote unquote guilty who have the incentive initially to make these Fourth Amendment challenges, but when they do win in court, you know, police might see it as, as a loss, but I think it is often a victory for uh, scores of innocent people when we're able to keep these rights strong. Right. The Bill of Rights was created to protect the innocent. In fact, mm -hmm. it, it plays out uh, perfectly. For example, uh, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, uh, the 2002 uh, traffic stops report found that uh, nine out of every ten police searches turn up zero evidence of illegal activity, which is quite fascinating considering that police officers generally pride themselves in the fact that they can tell. Like when they have a hunch, mm -hmm. they know, but they don't report when they miss. It's just they don't admit that. Sort of like gamblers, you know, who right. claim they win every time. Um, and so on, you know, on that end, uh, that's fascinating. Of course, we, we also wonder, you know, uh, the, pers the, the one out of ten that where they do find something illegal, I mean, you, for the most part, you're dealing with uh, tiny amounts of, of contraband. Uh, mm -hmm. And so is it worth 
humiliating and you know depriving the rights of nine innocent people in order to find that one and the reason I believe police officers are so keen to do this is because they, they'll report to you they say people are glad to help mm -hmm. and I think that that is BS. They're intimidated. They're intimidated, so they do something kind of mm. like this. Oh, go, go ahead, officer. Oh, no problem. Glad to help out. Mm. I mean, it's just this groveling. This is a very ancient response to dealing with authority. authority. Right. I mean, this isn't this isn't someone who's really glad to do it. But in in a way, they're putting on their best face. They're saving their face in, in a sense. But right. that's not something that people should be doing in a free society. And the idea that, that this is you know a voluntary act on the part of citizens, I think, is, is highly questionable, too. And for example, in, in Austin, Texas, uh, the police there instituted a policy where they informed citizens of their right not to consent to searches during traffic stops and uh, had them sign a waiver if they wanted to, to waive that right. And there was an immediate 60% reduction in, in consent searches. 63%. 63 yeah. was it, yeah. And you know, so that, that goes to show you right there. You know, the second you tell a citizen, no, you don't have to let this stranger whose goal is to possibly arrest you for a crime mm -hmm. start digging through your private belongings by the side of the road when your mm -hmm. boss could drive by at any moment mm -hmm. and see this and, and judge you, you know, and that's that's something people aren't comfortable with. So what and am I signing here? It's the intimidation factor that that I think primarily contributes to citizens uh, placing themselves in that situation. Yeah, I don't know how. Well, you're th you're working on another video, right? And that mm -hmm. the, what's the focus of that video going going to be? The next video it will be entitled. The working title right now is Street Law. How to deal with police and racial profiling, right. uh, and you can you could argue that this is going to be uh, busted 2.0. Um, mm -hmm. We've been watching people watch busted. We've watched it with watching people watch it probably hundreds, maybe thousands of times. You know, at conferences and booths, uh, and we pretty much know it more than we would ever care to. Um, but we've seen how people respond to it. We know where people get really excited. Mm -hmm. We know where they start kind of nodding off. We know what information really sticks and we know what doesn't really stick or maybe just the stuff that people already know and don't really need to. Which cops um, hit their buttons. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we've created a better screenplay. It also will, we will also focus much more on uh, people of color who are much uh, more likely to be pulled over, uh, handcuffed, arrested um, during a traffic stop because of racial profiling is for real. I mean, whether or not it's, it's officially banned and, you know, we're in New Jersey, for example, right now they're actually talking about uh, passing federal legislation to eliminate the practice altogether. Regardless, it's still going to exist, I think, on some But they're not going to change the uh, powder cocaine versus crack cocaine law. Right? Yeah, there's yeah. certainly they're a, talking uh, about that one, too. Yeah, they've been talking about that for years. Mm. So, so we know that, you know, we think that uh, it's important to focus on those folks who are actually going to be the most uh, harshly impacted mm -hmm. uh, by these, these, these uh, search policies. Right. Um, so, you know, focus on that. We'll also be focusing more on um, something else. What do you do after you've been the victim of police misconduct, what are the best, what's the best practice? What's the best thing to do to, to find restitution, to, to bring about justice? Uh, what's your best shot there? And we've actually uh, discovered, for example, um, the most important thing to not do immediately after the victim of police misconduct is to file a police misconduct report. That's absolutely the worst thing Why that you that? can do because um, you're tipping off the police essentially like you you that's a mistake that that a lot of these you know plaintiffs attorneys are telling us they say, they say if i have a client who comes to me and tells me that a victim of police misconduct report asked, the first thing i ask them is did you file a police misconduct report and if they say yes i say you've made my job a lot more difficult so this is something that's sort of this is one of those counterintuitive okay. things that that mm -hmm. that will be added uh to street law how to follow up and how to how to seek justice um, and compensation potentially because we believe we want to create more good plaintiffs people who have been the victim of victims of police misconduct to sue the hell out of police departments that are routinely violating people's civil rights and civil liberties 
because doing so is a good thing. Because if this is what these police agencies are doing, they ought to be defunded if they're not protecting people's rights. Right. That is supposed to be their job.